Hi everybody, uh, Dr. Stutzer here. I'm going to review systematic reviews and uh, how to critique a systematic review. This is uh, the content we went over in uh, class six. And uh, so I want to review the, the process and uh, apply it to the um, study that we looked at related to student nurse stress. So if you look at this um, critiquing box 18.1 from your text, you'll see that there's uh, it's kind of color coded. Green is for all, all studies. Blue would be if it was a quantitative a systematic review, yellow a qualitative systematic review, and then back again to all systematic reviews. I'm going to focus on the uh, quantitative systematic review because those are the ones that we're looking at for the purposes of this course. And what I mean by that is we're really looking at interventions, so we're really looking at measuring the impact of some sort of action that we're taking uh, on a population and then looking at, at the outcome. So the first thing that you're going to look at is the problem statement and whether or not the uh, research problem was clearly stated. Did, did you understand what the researchers were looking for when they went and did their systematic review? You also want to ask, is the scope of the project appropriate? So have they done something that's so broad that it appears that they're not going to be able to find succinct information in the end? Or was it so narrow that perhaps there's some real limitation to the amount of information they're going to find? And then was the approach to integration uh, described and appropriate, meaning what did they do with all of the, these studies that they found? How did they utilize the information? And does that seem appropriate? So did they do um, a literature integration? Did they apply meta-analysis? Did they apply statistical testing to determine the effect size of the uh, studies that were in, at hand? An effect size is a calculation that's done on the data. And it's not the data because these uh, researchers don't go back and get the original data from the researchers, but they are applying it to the data available from the um, studies. <clears throat> Pardon me. The next thing you want to see is the search strategy. And so did they explain how they selected their studies and uh, are the criteria defensible? And so, again, these are your judgments as you're looking at it. And it is about does it make sense? Was it clearly described? And does it make sense for what they were trying to do? You want to know if what databases they used, were they comprehensive, uh, and what keywords were identified. And I like to call this the recipe. So the question is, if you or I wanted to go back and relook at this systematic review, would we be able to replicate to a reasonable degree what the researchers did based upon the information they provided us? And then did they use supplementary efforts to identify studies? Did they go to gray literature? Did they go back to the original researchers? Did they use other types of approaches in order to be as comprehensive as possible in locating studies. The sample, so the sample is the actual number of studies that they locate and so did that, did they end up with a good number of studies and if a primary study report was lacking information, so they read the study report, they're not able to find the information they're looking for, did they go back and um, try to reach the original researchers to get clarity? Quality appraisal is, did they appraise the quality? Did they use some sort of well-defined criteria or some sort of appraisal scale? And remember that um, we are looking, when we do quality appraisals of the studies, and um, we did this in class, we are using the Hopkins format to determine level and quality of research. There are other um, types out there. The American Association of Critical Care Nurses has their own. Um, you'll see sometimes, uh, I know the Heart Association uses a particular type of leveling, and typically at the end of those um, guidelines, somewhere in the journal, is will, it will be described. You'll often see them looking like a pyramid. Melnick and uh, Fine Out Overhaul have uh, one that they use, and they put systematic reviews at the top versus, for example, Hopkins putting randomized control trials at the top. So you do have to be mindful of the fact that different 
there are different uh, different um, approaches to looking at the the quality and the level of of the research and it's nuanced but you just want to appreciate that depending on what you read it may look a little bit different um, the other questions around quality appraisal are were there two or more people doing the appraisers and appraisals and was interrated reliability reported so again we're looking at um, was there any bias really in terms of, of how it was looked at and uh, was quality information used effectively in selecting studies and analyzing results so you're what you're looking for in uh, reading a systematic review is evidence that this w the researchers were mindful of how to approach what they were finding in as objective way as possible. Then data extraction, and this is in uh, systematic reviews, you will often find pages and pages of tables. It is not up to you to now go in and analyze each individual line. Um, that is not how we determine the level or quality of a systematic review. The, those tables are to give you a sense of what's there, and you may use them uh, to determine, for example, the quality of the systematic review and the level of the systematic review based upon the types of studies they looked at. So the question is, did they extract enough information at the sample characteristics and the study findings, and how did they enhance the um, the overall integrity of the data. Again, looking at bias, was there more than one person involved in what was happening? And then um, was there some explanation of how they integrated their data? Was there some explanation? Did they use tables? Um, how did they summarize their findings and was it uh, effective? Then in terms of data analysis, uh, if it's a quantitative okay. study, uh, was there meta-analysis? And again, more and more, because there are more studies uh, published and uh, available to us, we're going to start to see more and more meta-analysis uh, to help us as users of, of this information and, and people considering interventions, what is the effect size. So effect size lets us know um, just how well that particular inter intervention impacted in overall. So in some studies, there might be a large effect size. In some studies, there might be a small effect size. And by pooling all that information, one can um, look at and evaluate the overall effect size of an intervention. Um, and if it's not performed, then, then why? And if it was performed, was it justifiable? And then there's some of this other terminology that we talked about in terms of heterogeneity of effects and um, random effects models. <coughs> Pardon me. And we can go over those again in class. Uh, for the qualitative, metasynthesis is a way of synthesizing the findings of all of the studies um, and, and summarizing um, based upon like the themes that the various qualitative researchers located. And then finally, for all studies, the conclusions. So did the reviewers draw reasonable conclusions uh, about the, the evidence that they found about these interventions? Were the limitations noted? And were the implications for nursing and healthcare as well as further research clearly stated. So I'm going to take us now to our study that we looked at, and the study that we looked at was um, Assessing Intervention Effectiveness for Reducing Stress in Student Nurses, a Quantitative Systematic Review. And of interest, this was done um, by two psychologists, which I think also explains the application, as we'll see later on, of a psychological framework. Um, but they were looking at student nurses. So the first question on the critique is, did the report state the research problem and or questions? Is the scope appropriate? Was the approach described and was the approach appropriate? And so if we um, actually even look at the very beginning of this in the abstract, we can see that the aim was to identify types of interventions effective in reducing stress and um, Another reason, only one review examined the effectiveness of stress interventions for student nurses. And because there's been new literature, uh, these researchers make the case that it's time to look at the information again. Additionally, as we work our way through the, the introduction, we find a nice uh, integration and summary of the information that's already out there. They make the case that there's a global nursing shortage. They make the case that um, 
learning and being socialized into managing stress during um, school may help prevent attrition, may enhance grades, but may also be behaviors that are carried further into uh, people's practice. And then within the um, within the publication itself, we see the actual aims, which was to identify the types of interventions effective in reducing stress and uh, identify uh, direction for future research. So that was the problem. And it would seem to me that this is uh, an appropriate scope. And um, this they describe that they're using a quantitative systematic review with narrative synthesis. Synthesis being how do we take uh, the information and not just say one study after another after another, but rather we identify uh, and bring together or integrate the information that we found. And so an example of this could be uh, up here. For many health professionals, training may be the time when they form enduring negative attitudes towards helping, help seeking for stress. And we can see that this was in Chu, Graham et al., as well as Ross and Goldner. Many studies, although not all, report negative relationships. And you can see as they go through, it's not that they're reporting the exact findings in each of these studies, that they've actually integrated the information for you to create the, the overall uh, understanding around what we know about uh, stress interventions. So to go back, um, they've clearly stated the problem, the scope seems appropriate, and they've identified their approach to integration, which is narrative synthesis. <clears throat> then the search strategy. So in the search strategy, they tell us very clearly, when you answer this question, did the report describe criteria and, they, and are they defensible, you're going to say, the keys that they identified them, the key search terms were, and why do we think that these key search terms made sense? And, and they make sense because they're only looking at nurses, uh, they're looking at students, they're looking at interventions related to stress, and we know that long-term impact of stress can be burnout, and so they were looking at uh, an outcome related to stress. They delimit the time frames that they're looking at, and that's because they know that this is the time period that the research has been done. Remember that this is a 2011 publication, so they were limiting up to close to the time of the publication. We know what um, the databases they used, these databases make sense in terms of the nursing, ba nursing, behavioral sciences, as well as uh, psych info. And they go on to say that selected papers were scanned for further studies, that uh, they did a manual search of key journals. They also say they provide inclusion criteria, so English uh, and empirical studies. And they had to actually describe the intervention as well as detail the outcome measures. So they had some very, um, some very specific uh, things that they were looking for um, in terms of delimiting the overall um, in inclusion of studies. So if we go back to the um, this box 18.1, the question was, did the report describe criteria for selecting studies and are they defensible? We would say yes. Uh, we would explain uh, that they were specifically looking for an intervention and they were specifically looking at the, the related outcomes. Uh, were databases identified and appropriate and comprehensive? Again, I would say yes, and that would be because not only did they use nursing databases, but they also used databases uh, in the, the uh, psychology literature. Keywords were definitely identified, and it was it's very evident they used supplementary efforts. So yes, they used supplementary efforts, including contacting the researchers and looking for additional studies uh, from the, um, looking for unpublished studies and uh, scanning the selected papers for further relevant studies. So that would be my search strategy response. The sample is really the search outcome. So there was uh, 186 studies. Uh, they then said 169 failed to meet the criteria. They got down to 17, and then they excluded if there was double hits or if there was not an abstract in the database because they, they were probably scanning these abstracts to determine what was in there. Um, and then if we go a little further, and I'll try not to scan too quickly, but if we go to page, um, here we go. So this is page 714. What you'll note here is that there's a flow chart 
of what was identified, what was removed, what they did, and how they ended up um, with the number left. So this is a pretty basic flowchart, but you will typically find in systematic reviews some sort of uh, flow uh, diagram that can also help you. So going back here, the questions are, did the search strategy yield a good sample of studies? It, it did. I mean, 186 is, is good. And if they were lacking key information, did they attempt to contact the original researchers? And yes, they did. Um, and you would just kind of say here, you would note that based upon the inclusion criteria, they got to 186 and that, you know, based upon then identifying further identification, they got down to 16. The quality appraisal is where you'll talk a little bit more about their how they appraise the quality of the studies. So the next part is, did they appraise the quality? Did they use well-defined criteria? Did two or more people do the appraisals? Was quality information used effectively in selecting studies or analyzing results? Now in this study, what's interesting is they do speak to that. <clears throat> and I'm going to just move us back up here. So they say quality appraisal is based on a set of key conditions for non-randomized studies, see table one. And then as we noted in class, these are three different publications. These authors each were involved in all three publications and a different author was first author each time. But this was what they used in, <clears throat> in order to determine quality. So they named the study, they named what the comparison was, and then they asked the question, did, the, did it make, they make a judgment, did it make sense? Um, did they try to identify any confounders, anything else that might uh, be able to explain the results beyond the intervention? Did they uh, def clearly define their analysis? Um, did different analytical strategies yield consistent results and are the results plausible? So they, they made a judgment on these. So that was the quality appraisal that they used. You'll often see, uh, you might see a quality appraisal where they're only looking for randomized controlled trials or they're only looking for randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental. So um, this is the, the piece here that, uh, let me just highlight this for you too, that um, tells us all about the, um, the quality appraisal. And they say if they met at least three of the five conditions, they were, um, selected for inclusion. So they did have um, a, a way of appraising. I would also note uh, the first author over here, the first author selected the papers by reading the abstracts. And if we go to the near the end of this, um, there is a statement or two about um, about the two researchers being involved in the review of this. Uh, and I highlighted it. And give me one moment. All right, so somewhere highlighted in here, and I won't uh, bore you with watching me roll through this, but somewhere highlighted in here, there is evidence that both the researchers were looking at uh, all of this information. And they each took a different role in how they looked at the information, but there was, um, there was collaboration. There was also some separate work that they did. And uh, here, robustness and trustworthiness of the analysis were assessed through discussion between the authors. So again, um, they were trying to be mindful of how to assure that their analysis was not biased and that they were um, both coming up with similar findings. Okay, so that was quality appraisal. Then data extraction. So <clears throat> data extraction, and I'm going to show you this table, which I now have to rotate view. Uh, rotate view. Hmm. Well, let me do that clockwise. There we go. Okay, a little small. But here's where we see the data extraction. And the question was, was adequate information extracted about design, sample characteristics, and findings? Were steps taken to enhance the integrity of the data set two or more people used to extract and record information for analysis? So that was uh, clearly noted uh, as I showed to you just uh, 
a moment ago. And then here's what they, they extracted from their studies. So which study it was, the country, the type of intervention that was done, how long the study took, the type of design, uh, and then targets has to do with the types of interventions. And we'll, we'll hit that kind of on the um, back end of talking about this. The outcomes that were measured, uh, and then the data and effect size, if, if that was noted. And we noted here, for example, uh, one of the things that it would have been nice to know about was who the sample actually was. So we know they're students, but were they first year students? Were they uh, from a two-year program, three-year program? So we really only know the number, and we know that they fall under the umbrella of students, uh, nursing students, but we don't know more than that. So we, we did agree that it might uh, have been uh, better to have a little more information. The other thing pointed out here is that the sample sizes truly varied. And in this case, this 853 in 27 weeks, the intervention was curriculum development. I'm thinking here that these uh, topics were topics that were actually um, mindfully addressed by the faculty in terms of developing the curriculum. And so they probably went in, and this 27 weeks is probably really, if you think about two semesters of 12 weeks each or 13 weeks each, so this is probably a one-year look at in terms of the various things that the students were going through and how did they uh, manage the curriculum, what changes they make in the curriculum in order to hopefully diminish some of the students' stress. But then you look at some of these other ones and you can see they did different things with relaxation and imagery and breathing and meditation. Um, and so our numbers are um, vary. We've got cognitive reappraisal, um, et cetera. So we do know what the interventions were. We'll get to this one, two, and three in a minute. Um, we also know that they did some experimental. They don't say randomized control, but they do say non-randomized experimental. They do say um, quasi-experimental. So there were a variety of approaches that were used. And I, I'm taking the leap that when they say experimental, they may well mean um, that this was a randomized control because this one says non-randomized. But again, it is a... It is a um, Oh, something to critique in that it's unclear how they're, they're using that terminology relative to the type of study. Um, so data analysis, did they go on? Did they explain their method of pooling and integrating data? Were tables, figures, and text used effectively to summarize findings? So they do, I mean, they do explain what they put in. The table certainly was effective in terms of um, the amount of information and, and what they uh, placed in there. And then they go into um, their results or summarizing the findings. And this is where, if you'll note up here, um, they talk about these three target, and that's what they were referring to when they say target one, target two, and tar target three in those tables based on a theoretical framework from Lazarus and Falkman and Ivancevich and actually Jones and Johnston, these were the three uh, interventions that they were seeking and that they used to evaluate relative to this systematic review that, again, let's go all the way back, was done to look at strategies to reduce stress in student nurses. Um, so that's the general approach to things. Then we have data analysis and the data analysis piece of this, remember, is this uh, if meta-analysis was not performed, was there a justification uh, for using narrative integration? And in this case, they were very clear about why they did that. Uh, and I just want to see if I, sorry, as I sweep through here, um, they basically say right here in the discussion, the review captured a diverse range of studies. And they go on to say that that diversity might be a limitation because it was difficult to draw valid comparisons and excluded the possibility of meta-analysis. So they were mindful of why they made a decision not to do meta-analysis. And so you would uh, use that as your support for why they did that uh, as and why it was justified for them to Address, um, handle it in this manner.
And then the last piece is, did they draw reasonable conclusions about the results and the quality of the evidence? Were limitations of the review and synthesis noted? And were implications for healthcare practice and future research clearly stated? So as we noted in class, there was a lot of discussion of these different targets, but when we get uh, and drill down into them, when we get over to the discussion area and in some systematic reviews, you'll, you'll just see the discussion. You won't see the more in-depth analysis of the various interventions. It just, again, depends on what the intent of the researchers were and what they wanted to bring forward to uh, as a result of the, the review. So they tell you what the limitations are. They tell you that all but one study was done in North America or the UK. They weren't RCTs. You know, so they explain what they see as some of the limitations. And then further down, um, they also make a note that few studies base their interventions or outcomes beyond the individual level and um, that there's a paucity of interventions at the organizational or interface level. So these are some um, concerns that they have relative to basically the state of the science. And so um, they go on to talk about the weaknesses of the studies and then also what further research needs to be done. And if you'll recall, that, that, that was their two points. One was to identify interventions and the other was to provide implications for further research. And so they go on to say future studies should carry out uh, power calculations and overall they provide for us um, sort of a roadmap of what next needs to be done. So in terms of their conclusions, did they draw reasonable conclusions? They did. Uh, and about the quality of evidence relating to their question, they clearly addressed that. Limitations were addressed and implications. And you would, again, you would say yes and this is what they said or in some way support your, um, your affirming that something was done or that you couldn't locate it with a brief sentence or two about what's in there or synthesizing the information in some way, shape or form. The other thing I just want to point out here that was kind of interesting is that they do delineate uh, who did what in relationship to the manuscript and the, the, the process. So again, there's another place here where we understand the contributions. So I hope that this uh, helps you in terms of again, revisiting um, how to critique a systematic review and um, what, where we located the information in this particular study.